Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Oakmont Sunday Symposium. Uh, our speaker today is Fred Euphrat, who's an expert in uh, forest hydrology, and Gabriel will be introducing him in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to mute everybody now and just unmute uh, Gabriel and uh, uh, Fred. Okay, so... Gabriel, you're on here someplace. There you are, unmuted, and Fred, unmuted. Yes, I see you unmuted, okay. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, we will be recording this session, so don't say or do anything you wouldn't want to show up on a minor recording. Um, <laughs> the... Um, uh, 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 if you want to ask a question, you're going to want to use the chat if possible. If you know how to raise your hand electronically, you can do that. Uh, but we do have enough participants that it becomes a little hard to see you physically otherwise. Although um, uh, Jeff and Judy will be keeping their eyes open for people who are raising their hands. Next week, we're going to have uh, Scott Medbury. Scott is the uh, director of the Quarry Hill Botanical Center. Uh, which I'm sure most of you have probably seen uh, up on Route 12 to the east of us. Um, uh, Scott's background is he came out of the San Francisco Conservatory and the Brooklyn Botanical Garden and has some interesting thoughts to share on uh, what they're doing uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the contemporary treatment of flowers. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to turn the program over to Gabriel and... Uh, Let's get started. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, I'll just first add a footnote on Scott. Uh, Scott is going to be announcing some very major new directions for the Quarry Hill Botanical Garden. So this will be part of a breaking news story that he'll be doing. And uh, with that, I want to say I'm really happy to welcome my old friend, Fred Euphrat to the Oakmont Sunday Symposium. Fred's really well known throughout the county for his leadership in conservation planning and as a popular professor at Santa Rosa Community College. He has a PhD in forest hydrology from Berkeley and has hosted a nationally acclaimed radio program. In our session today, we get to know Fred as the manager of his family's 419 acre, acre working forest near Healdsburg, whose state-of-the-art forest manage, management policies were devastated by last year's Wallbridge fire. But I also want you to know, all to know, something that isn't known about uh, Fred, who's otherwise famous in the county. <laughs> he, he, he is, his, Fred was co-researcher with me on a study of the success of community forestry in Nepal that directly fed into Professor, Professor Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize in Economics, the first received by a woman economist. Also on the session here today, uh, someone who provides us cultural and emotional sustenance is Fred's partner, Robin Pressman, who hosts from their Occidental home classical KDFC's The Home Stretch from three to eight daily, including the Island of Sanity. Uh, thank you, Fred and Robin, and I've got to mute because I'm, I'm getting a call from France here. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, um, hi, everybody. It's, it's really my pleasure to be here and um, you know, it, it, 2020 was a tough year. What can I say? Uh, you have all had your experiences and I certainly have had mine. Um, most profound among them was the Wallbridge fire where our property, which I'll start the slideshow on shortly, uh, which we've been sort of nurturing since 1960, um, experienced a devastating fire. And now it's a question of how to rebuild. And what I'd like to do today is talk about a little bit about the property and uh, a little bit about what's going on. Um, give you a look at what modern logging looks like 
and maybe have a discussion about where we go from here. So um, with Zoom being what it is, I will take all of that. Everybody has like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So uh, why don't we dive right into the, the presentation if we can. Um, and, and it will be coming up right here. And pardon me. We will now share the screen with the proper presentation. Put it on. <clears throat> the beginning. And have a little talk. Great. So uh, we've, my dad bought this land when it was clear cut in 1960. And it has been our family forest for, for outings. And uh, it turns out for timber nurturing for a long time. Uh, back then land was $100 an acre. So the clear cut land he bought up in the Healdsburg area. And here you can see Healdsburg, Windsor, Larkfield, Santa Rosa. And our, we're out here on Mill Creek, which is one of the, the things that drains northern Sonoma County. This is the Redwood Zone of Sonoma County. Uh, Fort, uh, Fort Ross is out here. And here's a little map of the, the property as we go forward so you can be oriented. Uh, we have a little piece of Mill Creek Road right here. And special treatment areas point out um, archeological sites on the property. You can see we have a few miles of roads um, and uh, a bunch of springs, but that doesn't really show you uh, what the forest looks like. And, and this is what the forest looked like when we bought it. This is an aerial photo with Mill Creek Road right here. And um, you can see all these bare areas. The best redwoods were, were a little bit left over in here. It had originally been logged in 1900 and then again in 1930, they took out all the redwoods. In 1960, they took out the Douglas fir. And we've regrown it back to this state. And this is 2020. And uh, so you can see how the redwood areas here, shadows really tell you what's going on in an air photo. Um, the, the trees in there are big and, and, uh, and pretty significant going down into these canyons. And there's some flat area up here. Uh, our neighbors are around us. So we were managing the stand as many forests are in, in the North Coast for stand growth first. Redwood is a, um, redwood is a very special crop. Douglas fir is a commodity. Uh, and the hardwoods that came up on the land are pretty much useful for only firewood. So we were really trying to grow it as a redwood forest. Um, also with aesthetics uh, and preparation for fire, that we did not have any idea that the fire would be the kind of fire that it was. We also did a lot of stuff like slash control so that the forest was not ready to burn. And in fact, this is some of the projects that we did over, over time on this property. Um, you can see it goes back to 1981 here for thinning and planting on this south facing slope, which which I would do on a north facing slope next time. Broom removal, uh, riparian planting, that means streamside. Uh, thinning and planting in that big redwood area we've, we've poked out a couple of times. Thinning and planting um, in some hardwood areas to make them beautiful. Fire breaks along the tops of the ridges. Harvest, uh, selection harvest to open up the forest and do sort of the, the uh, how to double your volume every 15 years by taking only a third of the stand. So continuous redwood harvest throughout the land. And we ended up with a stand that looked a little bit like this. Um, here you can see big redwood trees, uh, big-ish, <laughs> not, not old growth, but good sized redwood trees and good sized Douglas fir with a crop of redwoods coming up underneath. Multiple cohorts of trees is the way we like to put this. So we had a 120 year old cohort and a 90 year old cohort 
and a 40-year-old cohort and a, a, a pretty fresh um, less than 20-year group. So you're seeing the less than 20s here. And we thought that that was going to be pretty good for stopping fire. And it, it, it looked good on air photos too. This is a, a, a LIDAR photo, which is a way to see the height of trees. And um, this was run by the county. And you can see here on our side of the line, this blue line is the property line. I've got this entitled fuel ladders uh, for a discussion with Pepperwood. Um, you can see basically the, across the property line, it, it's undistinguishable fuel ladders. But on our side, there's all this heterogeneity going on for wildlife, for fuel reduction, for stopping a fire that is moving along the ground. We did not get a fire that was moving along the ground. We got a fire that was larger than that. We also had some improvements on the property because a property is nothing if not a, a place for people to set their, their uh, foot on the land. Most important thing you can plant on the land, of course, is, is your foot. So we had a cabin, uh, a little, little wash house area, some, um, some relics of my, of my family, uh, and it, it really was a place that, that the whole family was interested in. We also had elements of the redwood ecosystem we were taking care of there. This is a ladybug uh, column. We used to have ladybugs so by, by the hundreds of thousands in hibernating uh, conditions, they'd all sit on top of each other. Here's a barred owl that I found while looking for uh, spotted owls doing uh, my due diligence for, for forestry. So we had some very special elements of, of the ecosystem with us. We also saw uh, the wood on the property as a, an opportunity to create beautiful tables and benches and chairs. And this was starting to turn into a real family issue. Um, people were seeing the aesthetics of the thinning that we had done and, and coming up and saying, wow, this is a great place. I'd like to hang out here. Well, of course, my children grow up. My daughter gets married. And the next thing you know, we are doing glamping and um, the glamping operation that's uh, glamorous camping <clears throat> the glamorous camping operation is called shelterwood voted best hip camp of california in 2018 where uh staying in the woods near healdsburg is a bargain and a treat and people just love the heck out of it um being out in the woods in a, in a, a little glamorous tent um, it was really a great operation for my daughter and son-in-law. And, and then of course the pandemic rolls around and their restaurant in San Francisco closes and then the fire happens and we lose shelter wood too. Here's the fire on August uh, 25th. And um, needless to say, the red are hot spots. This is how the fire, where it had burned and this is where it was progressing. This is the Myers fire over here and the Wallbridge fire over here. That was not a good week for us. So we got caught up in that fire. And I was trying desperately to see what was going on with my land. Uh, the question came up, when did you learn? And the answer is, I was watching the, the MODIS, um, that would be this, the satellite uh, infrared cameras the whole time. And now here is a remote sensing from Copernicus, which is the European Space Agency. It tends to fly over us in one way or another all the time. And you can see the ash on the ground. You can see the, the, the burn through the canyons. You can see the trees that are left as green. And these white lines are the property lines, the APN lines. So there you go. I had some trees over here. I'm working hard on, on keeping these areas together. So one way to see it is my whole land was burned. Um, and uh, all the Douglas fir trees were killed and all the hardwoods were killed. But another way to see it is, I still have 100 acres of redwoods. However, a lot of it looks like this. Uh, this is what I saw when I came in while it was still smoking. The white on the ground is of course not snow in the Sierras, but ash in Sonoma County. And the hardwoods had taken a similar beating, in fact, worse. We'll take a look close up at the hardwoods 
Uh, this is a mixed Douglas fir and hardwood stand. And by the way, when I say hardwoods, I mean broadleaf trees, uh, including oaks, tan oaks, um, madrone, bay, that kind of tree. And softwood trees are the conifers, and we grow Douglas fir and redwood. And here's a redwood up close. Uh, after being burned, you can see it's damaged. Uh, the, the, its bark has been scorched. But over here is a madrone, and you see its bark is completely pulled off, and we can see the beautiful red of the wood underneath. It's gorgeous. We're stockpiling them, but uh, only for, for making ornaments of wood. The redwood we evaluated uh, at the sort of 100% level to see if their, if their bottoms were okay and if their tops were okay. So we ended up saving some trees and you'll see those as we move forward here. A lot of land looked like this, steep, burned, no leaf litter on the ground, no wood in the streams, nothing to hold erosion back except the irregularity of the topography and the micro topography that was created and the future trees to come falling down. At this time, we're harvesting these individual Douglas firs and knocking over as many of the other trees as possible uh, so that we can reduce erosion further. We also, as I said, we've lost the woody debris in channels. As somebody who's looked at forest hydrology and geomorphology and how streams develop, this is a scary picture. There's one chunk of wood here. All of the rest of the wood was in the stream holding up the banks and burned. So we're going to see erosion maybe on a thousand year scale if, if we're not lucky. So now we are doing industrial timber harvesting in Sonoma County. So uh, with your permission, I'd like to, to show you what that looks like. Um, let's take a look. This is a, this is a feller buncher. Working on a redwood. It grips it, it's got a chainsaw in it. It's a self-leveling tool so it can go on steep ground. Oh, well, careful, oh. And there's the chainsaw cleaning up the end. As a forester, this is super interesting to me. And then the machine can just pick it up and move it. Zoom. And this is what we're doing to the ground right now. We're also using a, a variety of other equipment. This is a heel boom loader, which is capable of picking up logs. This gentleman over here, his official title is a knot bumper. And he's walking around to make sure that all the trees are ready for being loaded into trucks. Meanwhile, we have other machines walking around the ground. This is a skitter. Uh, for those of you who keep track, it's probably a D6H uh, caterpillar. Um, and it's working with the feller buncher over here to try and move the wood as quickly as possible through the forest so that we can get these people in and out of here as fast as possible. The other thing that we're doing is cable yarding. Ready? Okay, let's pull it. So here's the cable yarder, moving logs uphill. This is a processor grabbing the individual logs, turning them into something useful. And here's our friend, the heel boom loader, stacking stuff up for trucks. And trucks is what we're doing. We're doing about 1,000 to 1,500 truckloads of timber uh, to four different buyers. And uh, this, is, <laughs> this is Joe Chambers driving his purple and white truck to Mendocino Redwoods with a good load of, Doug, of Douglas fir.
But it goes beyond that. We're also going to be re replanting the land or have already started replanting the land. And uh, this is 23,000 seedlings that were, uh, I brought from PRT Nursery in Cottage Grove, Oregon. They are the, the seed zone of Sonoma County, which is 095, Sonoma and Mendocino County. I also picked up another 15,000 or so for the neighborhood so that uh, I could sell trees out. And here you see a happy seedling planted next to a, uh, a log waiting for the next two or three inches of rain. The log is gonna act as both shade and mulch. And none of it would have been possible without people. I've got uh, professional loggers. I've got professional tree planters. I've got uh, people who can do a really great job in a pretty quick amount of time. Uh, trees, 15 people for three days planted 27,000 trees. How do I see this as, uh, as an element? Well, you know, it's possible to see this all as destruction, but I choose not to. The world, we may be told that things go from, from Manzanita up to Douglas fir to redwood to old growth, and then there's something that happens. And we go back to grasses and fireweed. And yeah, well, something happens, but it, it's more like this. Uh, there's all these ecological systems and you can take a shortcut through the ecological system anytime you want. And so we took a little bit of a shortcut here. I think that uh, with climate change, we'll be thinking about um, uh, Santa Cruz trees and Big Sur trees as we move forward. We expect to always like go to the end of the cycle. We look for old growth. We know that the world's not that kind. We know that we always have to adjust and we know that the future is always just, just around the corner. That, by the way, is the beautiful Robin. Um, the ecosystem can get stuck at an earlier seral stage, seral meaning a part of that ecosystem, and get knocked back. It can get knocked back to restart, which is where we're going. We're going back to re-sprout. We've already grown three feet uh, since the fire. We're going to reseed a lot of those Douglas fir that were left over there. We'll be putting out seeds like crazy and we're probably gonna have deer as a problem next. And we're gonna recover. This is a picture of pepperwood where a fire went through twice and the oaks just said, I roll with it, I'm with it. We're also gonna have to reconsider. I know you've uh, heard from Sasha Burlman and this is some control burning we were doing on the property. And I'm happy to say that these trees fared better than almost any other trees on the property with the fire because they had no fuel around them. Ultimately, it is about the generations. Shelterwood was the business of my, my son and da daughter and son-in-law, and they just gave a birth to their COVID baby, um, Beckett Allen Bailey. I'm so proud of them, and I'm very happy for me, and I'm very happy for that the land gets stewards to take care of it into the future because it's all about continuity and the people we put together and the families we put together and the ecosystems we put together are all have to move, recognize that there's gonna be change and move together. And I am very proud to have a step great grandchild in law. And uh, uh, I see that as part of my own continuity here. I am very lucky to be working with kids and seedlings and ecosystems. So, we're in, we're in a firestorm these days, but don't get biased by the perspective of the, of the day because it's, it's a circle, not a line. And it's not like we're going to nowhere, we're going somewhere. We just have to loop back. It's always going to occur, creating a new ecosystem, always new. It's always been that way. And so I'm happy to see it that way. And of course, I wanna know what your questions are. It's a tough year. Let's hope that we can um, get through the next one well. And thank you so much, so much for your uh, attention today. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll do this by uh, putting comments on the chat and by electronically raising your hand. And if you have to raise your hand physically, uh, somebody will try and catch it. Fred, let me ask a first question if I can. Um, how much of the area around you uh, is being recovered in anything comparable to what you're doing? 
I think that's a great question. Um, people are uh, just in general, people are concerned about clear cuts. And the biggest issue with, with land changes is when it happens over a broad scale. So I'd say my neighbors are increasing the heterogeneity of the landscape by recovering in different manners. Uh, at 400 acres, I can afford a, um, an industrial logging operation. At 10 acres, people are gonna have to pick and choose the trees they're falling and just do it for hazard. So it'll be managed in, in many different ways, as many different ways as there are landowners. Does the uh, cost of your scale of operation pay for itself or not? Oh yes, it pays for itself. And the other thing here is that since I've been growing the trees on purpose for 40 years, I have good trees to sell. So it's not like I was, remember I showed the difference between my forest and the next guys. Right. Um, I didn't let all the Douglas fir hang out at, at too small to harvest. I let them grow into good, clean, straight, low defect harvestable trees. So yeah, it's paying off, the work paid off. Okay, uh, Sue Aiken, you had a question. I do. Um, early on, um, you said something about you didn't expect the kind of fire you hadn't, uh, that, and I, with your background, um, it's scary to think to, for me that someone with your background would not expect this kind of a fire or the reaction on your land to that, to that fire. Maybe that's it. And I'm just curious why not, because I, you know, it just has such an impact on the whole state park system and so many things. Um, uh, there's a few sort of paradigms that have fallen apart in the last uh, decades. And the first is that we expect material that's in contact with the ground to stay wet enough during the dry season to break oh, down. Really? Oh. Uh, imagine if you kept adding to your compost pile and it never broke down. I mean, then you just have a big pile and you would have no soil. Well, that's what we were doing in the woods. Every time we cut trees and added them to the, the soil, we, instead of adding uh, soil, we were just adding firewood. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it ended up being a barbecue. Uh, I think the other thing I didn't expect was um, lightning in the middle of summer. Uh. And uh, on the same day or three days before, 105 degree temperatures and 20 in a mile an hour. Right, right. All came and together. It all came together. That was, it was 100 degrees plus the day it burned with 20 mile an hour winds. The flames were 300 feet tall. So not really much of anything could be done with that. Well, the best that? thing we could have done, and ironically, we were perhaps about to do this, um, was to uh, do pre-burn uh, and burn it during the winter so that we got rid of all of those fuels on the ground. And uh, needless to say, I'd been trying to burn those fuels on the ground for several yeah. years and had a burn plan and a burn boss and a burn insurance for the, for the time just after, just. <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah, you. We didn't do that project because we never got that far. That was for November. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jeff, you had a question. So Fred, you started to head my direction here and, and I'm happy to hear it. Um, you mentioned uh, having done some uh, controlled burns. Um, what is your plan going forward? Are you gonna do more of this? Is it targeted to specific areas or specific types of, uh, of, of how you have identified your land? And then finally, if you would finish with, how do we get the state parks on board with this? Oh, um. Well, first off, the state parks is a leader in this. So let's, let's give them their due. Uh, I've even burned in Annadale myself, uh, and that was several years ago. So state parks is, is not really the problem. Uh, the, the issue is more all of these small private landholders who are terrified of doing anything small. So we have a new prescription, and it's called Pepperwood. <laughs> And, the, and what we do is we have three guys cutting stuff and nine guys pulling stuff and bring it into piles and burn those piles during the winter. And that way we reduce the fuel in the trees. So we go up about 10 feet and, you know, we lower for oaks, but whatever. Um, and try and get all of the dead material and dead fuels uh, or likely fuels or ladder fuels out of the way and burn them 
literally uh, during the winter. It's not a prescribed burn, it's a pile burn, but uh, uh, fire is the answer to fire, yes. Uh, Dell asked the question, uh, what do you have as advice for the Hood Mountain uh, burned areas, which are extensive and serious? I've been working, uh, I don't know the Hood Mountain burned areas. I have been working, however, in Nuns Canyon and uh, a variety of the other burned areas for open space. <clears throat> right now, what we're doing is we're taking down the dead material to put it on the ground. So there'd be like a bay that burned and there'd be one dead shaft coming out of it and a bunch of re-sprout around the bottom. We're trying to take out that one dead shaft so that we can use it as erosion control and put it on the ground. Um, do erosion control in those the specific streams that look like they're too steep to handle it and um, encourage the vegetation to go the direction we want it to. So, uh, it, you know, it comes down to, it depends. Uh, what did you had a question? You want me to tackle or do you want to ask? And I'm seeing the questions come in. They're coming in. Yeah. Uh, Juanita, you had a question. Yeah, I was just thinking about scale on this. Uh, we have lots of national forests and mm. some in very rugged terrain. I, I can't see, I can't imagine how we can manage that in the way that you're talking about. Do you see it as possible? I think that Are the you? prescribed burn people ha really have that uh, much better worked out than I do. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to reintroduce fire to the landscape on in forests about every 10, 15 years. So uh, having crews go through, take material down to the ground and then running and pulling it away from the stems and running a fire through, getting a little bit of mortality with that. Sounds like the best way to keep the trees spaced uh, and keep the, the possibility of catastrophic wildfire uh, away from us. So in, in, it's more about removing the small trees than the big trees. But you think it is, it, it is possible to do that even on the scale that we have to do it? To I think that if we, I think the Native Americans managed to keep the old growth redwoods here for a very long time by burning the landscape every 15 years. Yeah, good point, good point. That's why they were here for us in 1900. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, question about uh, whether you're involved in the Boulder Creek area. Oh, okay, no. Okay. <laughs> Easy answer. Um, a question about uh, whether your activities you're doing uh, offer opportunities for youth to participate. Oh, yes, absolutely. There's a number of uh, youth crews in the area. Uh, Circuit Riders is one. North Bay Conservation Corps is another. CCC, California Conservation Corps, is another. Sonoma Ecology Center is another. And we work with all of these groups in various locations to, uh, to push stuff forward. And um, one of the organizations that's working very hard on that is Sonoma County Community Foundation, which is staying in touch with all those groups to see whom they should fund. Wow. Right. Interesting. See also um, land. How do we do prescribed burns without having an unhealthy, smoky environment? Um, do them in winter. Um, Hey, hi Gabriel. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the stuff I'm talking about is doing burns during the burn season and uh, during the, when I say burn season, I mean November to April. Um, and uh, then you can have a, you can burn your fires just before it rains and the material, uh, the particulates catch up in the rain and come back to earth. Um, not into people's lungs and back into the soil where it belongs. It's, it's a good way to do carbonization, to do biochar. Okay, a uh, question about uh, how the pattern of burning has changed from being something that we associated with the high Sierras to something that's now at much lower elevations. Huh. I, I, I don't understand that exactly. Um, I think the high Sierras have always had burns, but I believe we've had burns here too. Uh, it might just be our pattern of, of where people were living. 
we've been doing much more fire suppression here on the coast where we have long time settlements than up in the high Sierra, which as, as the name implies, <clears throat> nobody lives there. <laughs> so we haven't been working on fire control there. So I think we're just seeing our coast catch up in a carbon way to the Sierras. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what insights do you want to share about <laughs> California's future on climate change? I think we should consider it, that we're moving into the desert. I think that we lived on the edge of the rainforest and the desert, and that's what gave us such fabulous biodiversity here. We have so many kinds of oaks, so many kinds of manzanitas, so many kinds of flowers. But uh, with climate change, our belts are sort of moving, and we're moving not into the rainforest, but rather into the Sonoran Desert. So the trees I'll be looking at are further south redwoods, um, uh, further south uh, hardwoods and see what we can do. I mean, there's some real good stuff that can come out of it. Maybe we can grow uh, native California sycamore now, uh, which is a beautiful tree. Maybe we should be looking at big cone Douglas fir. Uh, there are a lot of changes that are happening that we see with animals moving up into mountains and uh, to, to fight global warming. And we are gonna have to adjust ourselves to essentially move further south just by while staying in the same place. Okay. Lynn, you had a question. Yes, I've read that there are somewhere between 125 and 150 million dead trees in California. Hmm. You're, yeah. So what to do about that and your operation that lasted three days and did wonderful work must have been quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to tell us what it cost to oh, bring sure. that, those uh, teams it in? It cost me about 50 cents a tree to buy uh, and about 75 cents a tree to plant. The faster I can get them going through the ground, the more trees I get planted. So I try and have the perfect ground for my planters, perfect in moisture, perfect in slope, perfect in, in slash distribution. So uh, it tends to cost me 50 to 75 cents per tree. There's also an organization called One Tree Planted, which, so, and then, uh, let, me, let me back up. I have all of this work supported by EQIP, which is the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is the farm bill. So I'm working through the farm, not bureau, but uh, farm services agency, US Department of Agriculture, to have assistance on all of these restoration activities I've shown you, not on the logging, but on the restoration activities. And I demonstrate to them that I am not interfering with the logging or the forest practice rules. And then we all hold hands and move ahead. But basically they'll be paying me, I don't know, about $600 an acre um, for the tree planting. They pay me about $900 an acre for thinning, uh, uh, about $15 an acre for burning, which doesn't cover anything. So we have all of these different um, programs that we are able to engage with. And there's also one called One Tree Planted that will give us 75 cents per tree just on top of it because they're selling carbon credits to people who take airplanes. Okay, so you had a question. <laughs> oh, um, uh, when you showed that picture looking down at yours and then your neighbor's land is not, does not look like your land. I mean, so what, what good does it do to do your land and then have a neighbor whose land is not, uh, and the piggyback to that is, uh, what's the permitting required um, and from whom, and are they, are they aligned with your thinking of the burns? Those are and great questions. Those are really great questions. And I saw one come through saying, does, does this pay for itself? The first answer is if you have redwood, you can afford to do this. If you don't have redwood, it's gonna be a break even situation. You have to have the will to do it and perhaps the culture to do it. Uh, many people come up here and want a vineyard and get a bunch of land behind it. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a cat in the conversation. We, uh, <laughs> and get a bunch of land behind it called a forest that they have no idea what to do with. So they are not looking at this as, as value on their land. Uh, I, I saw the forest as value here. So 
maybe I'm not answering your question, but every landowner has a very different goal for their land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's the benefit of doing it in one place and not another? Well, I would go with heterogeneity. We can't have all the landscape look the same. Yeah. Um, and I would like to grow trees. That's my goal. Yeah. Uh, some landowners would like to grow grapes. Some landowners don't care. Um, it would be yep. nice, and we have a forest working group that I'll do a plug for, to get people to understand what controls fire and uh, how to live in a forested landscape. But it's hard to maintain a culture of how to live in a forested landscape. Right. Mm -hmm. Who with 100 acres knows how to drive uh, a tractor? I just learned. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> So the other part of the question was the permitting. Uh, what, what's yeah. involved before you strike uh, This is all under the California Department of Forestry. Mm -hmm. And normally, and the California Department of Forestry works with CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, to ensure that CEQA is maintained for doing this. Uh, for their regular forest management activities and for this emergency, uh, they have a... Um, a negative declaration from the state of California in order to do it. But that still requires holding hands with the water board, um, fish and game, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Department of Archaeology, yeah. tribes, um, wow. uh, county. So we all have to create a document that they can live with and like. And I have Robin here, so she knows the sound of making that. Wow. <laughs> Um, the new administration has uh, people who have a little more of a sensitivity for climate change and the problems we're going through here in California. Um, have you had a chance to interact or your, your, any of your groups uh, with Congressman Thompson and talk about the new infrastructure bill? Whoops. I mean, not personally, I've been so involved in this. Okay, Fred, we missed the start of that, if you could. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not familiar with the climate infrastructure bill. That's uh, just not, my, not in my wheelhouse, but I'll tell you that the more work we do with carbon and energy, the better it's going to be. And we need to be getting off uh, of a real carbon economy. I would like to see the county, and we haven't really gotten here yet. We need to deal with all the small landowners who have less viable um, forest than I do to create a supply of inexpensive wood and a supply of energy and a supply of other wood materials that everybody can take advantage of in, in this county because right now we have what 50,000 at least 10 to 50,000 people owning forest land in Sonoma County uh, so we we need all the climate infrastructure support that we can get for dealing with carbon and sequestering carbon um, you, you talked a little bit about it, but how much is the problem of the uh, stream bed erosion worrying you and how much of a problem is it back in the whole Wallbridge fire area? That's a really good question. You know, we just had coho reintroduced uh, into Mill Creek through the, um, the broodstock restoration program that's associated with Warm Springs Dam. And uh, there, there's a 50 year tail right there. But uh, we know that this kind of erosion is not good for fish. And so we're hoping for slight and gentle rains as we get the area re-sprouted and re-established around creeks that where we, we are working, we're doing active erosion control. <laughs> Robin and I are going out to erosion control today. <laughs> and uh, so, we do what we can, but I think this fire will be an epochal change if we get some heavy rains to the Mill Creek watershed. It'll be like logging in 1900. Um, as your uh, new trees take root and begin their growth pattern, um, the areas that have been heavily burned over, um, when is it that you need to go back in and really worry about their exposure to the next fire? I would say when we do thinning, uh, we will be growing trees about 15 feet apart and they will be their own little islands without debris in between them, except maybe burned grass or uh, dry grass. 
So uh, in five to 15 years, when we go back in to do our first thinning and trim the remaining trees up uh, to create space, like I showed you before, we're going to be pulling all of that material out and burning it. So um, whenever we enter the forest, we reduce fire danger. Okay. So the, the grasses in between, you do not consider to be that big a problem? If I could burn them in winter, I would. Okay. All right. So uh, give us a momentary sales pitch on, uh, as homeowners, what should we be doing to prepare our property and home for fire? You should start at your house and work your way out. You should see that you have five foot of, of concrete or non-combustible all the way around your house. You should look for things that, that will catch fire. I'll sound like a fire marshal here. Attic vents, roof gutters with, with uh, uh, debris in them, firewood piles, wooden decks. Um, make sure you have a fire extinguisher, fire hydrant within 100 feet of your house and water to it and when the fire truck arrives and and speak to fire safe sonoma and cal fire and let them tell you what's going on we had talked earlier about uh the flammability of of trees near your house obviously follow cal fire's rules um uh, i wouldn't worry so much about the explosiveness of individual plants as the distance to the house and the preparation of the house Firewood okay. piles underneath decks are the place to start. Okay, you are uh, planting both redwoods and Douglas firs. No, sir. I am planting redwoods and I'm letting Douglas firs seed in by themselves. Okay. Redwoods being the the uh, the valuable crop and Doug fir getting in the way. Okay. Um, so, is Douglas fir still considered to be a serious fire hazard? All trees are a fire hazard. No, I meant Douglas firs particularly. No more than any other. Okay. Uh, Douglas fir tends to leave some dead stuff below, but it's the it's when you start getting ten thousand trees per acre, that you know, or five thousand trees per acre, and they're all killing each other, and you create this big mass of of explosive material. If you can walk by anything in the middle of winter and say, "I bet I can light that thing on fire," you probably can. So. I would use your own judgment. You're humans. You know what fire looks like and what fire conditions look like. So um, uh, if you can see space between the trees and their canopies aren't touching, your fire danger is much lower. Douglas fir is more fire prone because it grows more densely. It's not the wood or the, or the, the oils. It's how it re-sprouts in the landscape. So a solitary uh, Douglas fir happens to have grown up over its lifetime in some particular place in and of itself you don't see as, as the issue. Not at all. Okay. Nor, nor a redwood, nor a eucalyptus, nor an acacia. Okay. All right. So you get the last question. Okay. Uh, when I look out on the east slope of Anadel, which mm -hmm. kind of faces Oakland, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it would appear that there had been, it was more of an oak woodland at one time, and there's firs, I'm assuming they're firs pushing up, and they're going to take over the oak trees. I'm going to, is that right? Or the oak trees last, but they will just be uh, overcome a little bit by the firs? Uh, I really appreciate that question. That uh, It goes with the, our, our oaks, our Douglas fir uh, flammable. Um, the Douglas fir are like a weed tree in the sense that they will just take any, they, they seed very productively. They'll take any purchase and grow from it. Uh, and then they'll, they don't care if they only live for 15 years. So um, they, they pierce, they, they seed very readily. They pierce oak stands. When there's Douglas fir growing through oaks, it's re really bad for the oaks. So practice, normal practice is to remove all the Douglas fir and get them out of the oaks so the oaks can withstand fire. Uh -huh. Does that answer your question? Oh yes, and I think that's what worries some oak monters who live across from that, across the creek from Annadale back there. And you can see that the oak trees are, it appears Here's to me anyway, overcome, overcoming. The yeah, oak. overcoming. When you start seeing those oak trees overcoming the oaks, it is a big issue, of mm -hmm. course. That side is the east 
northeast yeah. face of Annadale. So, so okay. I would say make it redwoods. Yeah. Okay. Encourage the redwoods. <laughs> well, Fred, thank you so much for a great talk and a great introduction to um, a sad part of our history. But as you say, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. I hope you enjoyed the uh, the films of the logging. Absolutely. Did you like that? <laughs> they were yeah. marvelous. Okay, good. Good. Well, well, almost you made you feel like you wanted to be be part of it. You know, until you start seeing those machines all lined up and start throwing logs out, it doesn't it doesn't feel real. Okay, okay. thank you I'd all. Like to, I'd like to remind everybody next week we have Scott Medbury, who's the new director for the Quarry Hill Botanical Garden, who's going to be talking about new direction that it's going to be taking. So with that in mind, see everybody next week. And thank you again thank so you. much, Fred, for a great talk. Bonjour. Namaste.